start that. Okay, Doug, so let's talk a little bit about um, solar here. Um, this is the April 27th section. Um, anybody have any questions directly, you know, before we get going or any any concerns, any issues out there in the in the wide, terrible world that's um, um, I was looking through some of the uh, solar news for this week, and there were a couple of new products I thought I'd, I'd touch on that I found kind of interesting. It's funny how solar is kind of evolving as an industry. We originally were looking at things like, I mean, here's a panel, we're gonna have a little bit bigger panel, it's gonna be a little more efficient, but now the products are getting a little bit more diverse, a little more interesting, at least from my perspective. For instance, um, Palmetto Protect is a company that's offering now online monitoring of your solar array, uh, regardless of who's installed it. So apparently a number of solar installers are kind of locking people in saying, I'm gonna set up your monitoring system for the panels. And that way you've got to stay connected to me. And some of them aren't doing a very good job of it. So, um, so anyway, so Palmetto Protect has a service here and they'll provide um, for free a monitoring service uh, that's just an app. So they'll set it up for you and you can monitor your panels on a, on a per panel um, level. And that's their free service. But then for $8 a month, they say that they will then have a professional sort of monitor it along with you. And if there's an issue, then they'll uh, go ahead and contact you and say, okay, here's what the issue is. And then for 25 bucks a month, this service will actually come out physically and inspect your array once a year. Um, so that not only do you have the monitoring service, but you have a one once a year annual inspection. And then their greater level is 49 bucks a month and they'll do the inspection and they'll actually do a cleaning and kind of a, a tweak like a, check for, for tightness, you know, torque specs and things like that. So I thought that was kind of interesting because we've talked in class about this as being a maintenance program as another business that you could get into. And this is a national program that's rolling this out right now on, on it looks like a pretty affordable basis, uh, you know, 49, 50 bucks a month for your array to be inspected annually, monitored, cleaned once a year yeah pretty good jay i um, missed the first few seconds uh what kind of service is that it's a it's a company palmetto protect and what they're doing is it's like a, a solar monitoring system uh that's independent of the installer so essentially you can um go in and just subscribe to the service anyone who has a solar array can subscribe i'm assuming this is going to be um residential it didn't i didn't go that deep into it because if it were like a utility scale or a big commercial system that'd be quite a bargain to have them come out and clean a utility scale system for 50 dollars a month you know that i would sign up for that <laughs> right away uh, another product that i saw that i thought was interesting is a company quick bolt has a an asphalt um, shingle mount and uh, the state of Florida, Siggy, that would uh, apply to you down there in Tampa, has yeah. just approved this product as uh, part of the Florida code. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, for hurricanes and the like, the wetness. But it's an above the shingle mount system. So yeah. you just sort of go right through the shingles. <laughs> I guess it's got a little bitumen pad or something that probably melts to the surface as soon as it's on. Yeah, there's a couple of manufacturers doing that and they're, be, they're de being deployed a lot. I'm, I don't believe it's gonna get 25 years, but they're, they're do it's, it's being used a lot. It's convenient because you don't need to uh, apply flashing and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a ready to go. Uh, there's another, pro it's called flash lock. It's probably the same as a quick bolt. It's doing the same thing. Yeah, well, they claim you could do it on a on an asphalt flat roof, and that would worry me especially. Yes, yes. I just had that, just had that exactly that problem I had with it, with, and I said the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it is what it is. Well, flat roofs are notorious for leaking, regardless, and you start sticking holes in them, 
that's a bad that's a bad combination. Um, another thing that I saw a new product. There's a consortium working on thin film, and it's headed up by uh, First Solar. And um, and I didn't realize this. Maybe you did, Siggy, but. Um, Thin film is, is currently 40% of the utility scale install. Um, I didn't know that they were doing that much thin film in utility scale. I didn't know the percentage, but I've been uh, visiting uh, frequently, like twice a year, uh, a utility scale solar project here in, uh, in Tampa, Tampa, operated by Tico, where now it's Nextera. And yes, they do have, I don't know, uh, 23 acres or something of first solar glass on glass thin film models. I was surprised to use them because they're relatively small. They're only uh, maybe uh, 24 by or 30 inches by, I don't know, 48 inches or something. And that's a lot of clamping to do, but yeah. that's what they used. Yeah, and, and with thin film being a less, uh, less efficient, those were probably only 200, 250 watt panels, I would think. Yeah, maybe yes. 200 watt. Yes, wow, yes. And by the way, uh, I did the Florida Aquarium and the, the panels that we used were first solar thin film panels, glass on glass, and they were donated to the aquarium by Tico. So maybe they weren't too happy with them. I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Well, they're, they're claiming that um, their thin film currently has about 19% efficiency. Um, good. And they're claiming they're going to push that to 30% efficiency within the next several years. So uh, that that would be pretty amazing. Uh, I was also surprised that First Solar um, is the largest manufacturer of thin film panels. They have 4,100 employees in the U.S. Uh, and they've got a big, big uh, panel manufacturing facility up in Toledo, uh, Ohio. They have uh, 500 employees there. But I think they're headquartered out of Arizona. Um, but you know, made in America, for what it's worth. It's probably owned by the Koreans, you know. But uh, you know, there's no such thing as an American company anymore, or any national company, really. Um, okay, so I found that interesting with the thin film, and there was another one of these new products, um, Anderson Optimization, and actually they're selling a service. Um, that's going to offer the first solar distribution grid mapping service uh, for the country. And uh, that's one of those things you wouldn't really think about when you're thinking about solar and solar jobs. But basically what they're talking about is mapping the installed base of solar so that you can begin to sell that to companies and to uh, grid operators, people like that, to know how what is the penetration of grid uh, for solar anywhere in the country. So that was an interesting new. Um, and then um, I've talked about in class before how, of course, solar uh, receives electromagnetic visible light from the electric, uh, electric, electromagnetic spectrum. And we've talked about if you could extend that visible light outside you know, the, the absorption of the energy into the infrared or the ultraviolet. And if you could extend into the ultraviolet, then cloud cover is no longer an issue, right? So, so weather becomes a non-issue for solar. But there, it's now a thing. They call them uh, NSP, night solar panels. And it is in the, um, in the experimental stage, but it's actually been proven as a working concept where they are harvesting infrared and uh, they get about 25% of the normal solar panel uh, collection, which what I assume would mean that it's about 5% efficient, uh, you know, if it's 25% of a normal solar panel. That's kind of how it was, was worded, but 24 hours a day, you know, it's night and day um, solar collection. So even though it's a much lesser efficiency, uh, there you're just talking about unlimited energy. You know, it, it seems to me it's a first step in, in a super game changer uh, if, if solar panels, um, you know, can, can operate as, at night, regardless of the weather. I assume regardless of orientation, you know, if it's a, a nighttime thing, 
as long as it's up, you know, that would make sense to me. So we'll, we'll see that. Um, I guess just as a sidebar, um, I'm, on, I'm actually traveling right now. I'm up in Vermont and uh, there are a lot of solar up here in Vermont, but I was looking at all the buildings and all these solar panels. And it occurred to me, we're looking like at the eight track tape of, of solar, you know, this idea of solar panels on rooftops is going to be kind of very quickly antiquated, you know, kind of, it, it struck me already as cumbersome. You know, these big panels up there, it, it just feels like we're very quickly going to go from the 8-track tape to the MP3 player kind of thing pretty quickly in solar. So we'll all joke about the days back in the early days when you used to put panels on the roof and had to bolt them in. And, you know, do you remember climbing on top of roofs? It was so silly. And now we just shake a can and spray it on the window. And that's our solar receiver, you know. And who knows what it's going to be, but uh, but that's the way it's going to be. It, it will evolve. So uh, those were some of the new um, technologies there. Uh, I also saw a report on um, the first two months of 2021 as far as energy. And uh, 2021... 2,263 megawatts of wind were installed in the United States for electrical, 1,516 megawatts of solar, nine megawatts of natural gas, and five megawatts of hydro. So except for those little, that nine and five, it's 100% solar and wind now. Um, and in the utility world, um, utility scale now renewable energy, which would basically be wind, solar, and hydro, account for 24.5% of the utilities grid um, in 2021. So a quarter of all of the energy now available to utilities, and that does not include commercial buildings and residential. So this is only utility scale, uh, is, is uh, renewable. Coal is 19.3% of the grid. So the gap is widening. I remember what, it was last year, I think, that renewables surpassed coal and now 6% lead. Nuclear is down to 8.5%. And of course, still the big one is, is natural gas. That's 40% or 44% of the grid. But they said that as of this moment in the United States, there, is, there are no coal power plants permitted or under construction. Uh, so there's none that are under permit, none under construction. So basically, at least for a year, we're looking at no coal. And I suspect that will continue on into the future because it's just not, it's not an economically viable alternative. So once again, we're really looking at wind, solar, natural gas. And, um, and I have heard a lot of uh, podcasts and discussions about how the natural gas power plants, some of these utilities are looking at it um, from a position of uh, that they're probably going to have to have it as a stranded asset, which strikes me as interesting, that they're already planning that their natural gas power plants will have to be abandoned before their sell-by dates, you know, that it will be what they call a stranded asset. Um, because the cost of operation will exceed the cost of new solar or new wind. So um, that's, that's an interesting turn of events there. And which brings me into the, one of the items um, that I wanted to uh, bring up for discussion more than me saying, because I wanted to get you guys' feedback. Um, recent, this week, uh, President Biden announced, you know, that he wanted to reduce emissions by 50% um, by the year 2030. And that seems to be a pretty aggressive pledge, um, at least on the face of it. Although as I started digging into some of the details of this, it's a little less aggressive than what was initially reported. 
you know, basically saying it was always reported that we want to cut our emissions by 50% by 2030. Well, that's pretty amazing, but it's backed up to 2005. So we want to cut our 2005 emissions by 2030 by 50%. Well, turns out 2005 was the top of emissions and we've already reduced our emissions by about 20% from 2005, just today. So, so really it's like, okay, we wanna reduce another 30% in the next 10 years, even though in the last 15 years, we've already reduced it 20%. So that makes a little more sense. It sounds a little more aggressive, but it's not as aggressive. Uh, the reason, the way we got the 15% uh, reduction or the 20% reduction, um, about 14% of that or so was, uh, no, 53% or 33% was just in the transition from coal to natural gas in power plants. Just that transition that has happened naturally because of economics in the last uh, 15 years has reduced it 33% of the 20%. Um, in, uh, industry and home efficiencies, like um, um, you know, the, the more efficient products, uh, a geothermal, for instance, that's reduced at another 12% since 2005. And vehicle fuel efficiencies has been about the other 15%. So, so those things have um, combined. So we're 20% of the way to our 50% goal. So we're already there. Now, the sources of greenhouse gas are primarily transportation, which is 29%, electricity about 25, industry about 23, and commercial and residential buildings about 13, and agriculture about 10. So I guess starting right there, you say, okay, well, is it realistic? I'll throw this open, and Siggy, you're probably one to speak up since, um, do you feel that it's realistic given the state of the industry that we could see another 30% decline by the year 2030? That seems reasonable. You think so? 30, and, 2030 is nine years from now, yeah. Yeah, and how would we achieve that primarily? Through the transition to renewables? Well, both uh, efficiency and uh, uh, renewable energy, solar, wind, and storage. I think yeah. so. And nighttime solar. <laughs> so. And nighttime solar. Yeah, I, I still wonder where the infrared is coming from at, at night. Yeah, it, it's funny because what, what I read, and it wasn't that clear in the article I read, it, was, it, was, it seemed like a different process. It, they were generating infrared, which was causing electron holes in space, they said. And so the transfer process was basically the reverse of solar, where photons hitting the solar panel caused an electron hole, you know, to generate through the disruption of the electron across the membrane. And they were saying somehow the generating of infrared is causing an electron hole in one of the um, sides of the panel. Uh, I didn't quite understand the science behind it, other than they claimed it worked. So um, that was interesting. Um, I think, you know, one of the issues, and we've talked about this a little bit, is um, transportation. You know, we're talking about electrification of vehicles. And, um, and one of the terms you're going to hear a lot if you're listening out there in the in the blogosphere or whatever, is the electrification of everything. You know, that's one of the goals of today's climate, you know, environmentalist is taking all aspects of home heating, cooling, transportation, and transmitting that over to electric from natural gas, from oil. Um, and, and that they're envisioning is then going to be powered by primarily a renewable energy grid. And um, that will lead to major reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. But especially in the world of transportation, that's a long-term project. You know, if you were to look at 
let's replace every single new vehicle on the market today with an electrical vehicle with electric vehicle and let's say we are no longer allowed to sell that uh, gas engine vehicles internal combustion engine it would be at least 10 years before half of the vehicles on the road would be electric because these cars are around for a long time you know people don't just all of a sudden throw them away unless there's a big cash for clunkers kind of thing that they go out there and they actually physically go out and purchase internal combustion engine vehicles. Well, you, you know, could have a green party in the parliament and that'll force you to uh, uh, buy a new car uh, that fulfills the emission standards. Yeah, yeah. Jay, I was um, reading about Whitney Tilson who talks about transportation as a service, T-A-A-S. And it's going to change everything. Yeah. And look him up because you know he's 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 got a in uh, a pretty interesting viewpoint of transportation as a service. Um, to where, you know, busing be electric, uh, cars, like you said, pretty much. No one's going to want to have a, a gas vehicle. Sure. Plus, the. Um, you know, cars autonomously driving you around. So. Yeah, we were talking about this. I was talking with my wife about that. Um, <clears throat> on, you know, she's she's a big supporter of the European model of mass transit. You know, because when we lived in Europe, it was great. You could get on a train. You could go to the city center. You could walk to wherever. And I, I was saying, well, America's not built that way to begin with. We don't have city centers where you can walk to necessarily in your cities and we're a lot more spread out. But it strikes me the future of mass transit is exactly what you're saying. It will be an app on your phone where a driverless electric vehicle pulls up. You simply, you can either say I want it exclusively or I'm willing to share, you know, and it's a different price. You hold your phone in front of the vehicle, it opens the doors, you get in, it starts taking you where you're going to go. When it's not in use, it parks in a designated spot that recharges its battery wirelessly, you know, so that when it's, when it's stationary, it's recharging. Um, and, and you see all of these little boxes sort of going around, you know, and, and they don't have to be, you can go forward or backwards, it doesn't matter because the vehicle doesn't have a driver. It doesn't doesn't care which way is front, which way is back. Right. So um, I just see that as being more to the American way of life rather than having fixed transportation routes that take you from one destination to another. It's sort of like the concept of the difference between a wired telephone and a mobile phone, you know? Uh, the concept is dramatic. When you say, for instance, in the old days, if I wanted to call Siggy, I would say, I have to figure out where Siggy is and I will call the location looking for him. Today, I call him irregardless of where he is because I assume his communication device is with him. So mass transit will become non-fixed in its in its routing, that can all be handled through through algorithms or whatever. So um, whether that will be better or worse, who knows? Um, but they already have some situations. In fact, I was talking with my friend Paulo about this. Um, the idea of ownership of vehicles is something that may be for our generation a thing. For the next few generations, not a thing. Why do I need to own this vehicle? I'm not, that my self-esteem is not built into this. So I use a vehicle when I need a vehicle. If I lease a vehicle for everyday use, if I need it for some other purpose, I get a different vehicle. I, I don't lease a vehicle. I lease access to whichever vehicle I happen to need. Um, if I'm going on a long trip, it has better range maybe. If I'm commuting, it may be smaller whatever, I don't know, but, but the concept changes. And, and I'm seeing, we're seeing edging towards that, but I, I and, and the other fly in the ointment is of course, I live out in the middle of nowhere. None of, the, none of these innovations come to us. You know, rural America 
will be stuck in the 1950s regardless. I mean, we are we don't have broadband. We don't have Uber. I mean, right now we don't have these things. Why would we suddenly have driverless taxis? I mean, they're not coming to Appalachia. They're going to be in the city centers. And, and that leads me to believe that we'll see a migration towards more densely populated um, communities, even though right now they're talking in COVID that that's the opposite. But that's, that's a silly, that's a thing for the six o'clock news to pretend it's a thing. You know, I think people are moving towards access of service, including broadband, including, you know, 5G virtual reality, apps, grocery delivery, restaurant delivery, all these services will far outweigh the idea of I'd like a garden that I get to mow the lawn periodically. You know, I think that's, that's where we're moving as a culture. Anson and Angel. Anybody else have any perspectives on this? Well, uh, my son already is showing me uh, your, the reality that you're predicting. Uh, uh, he's 20 years old and he, he's not really interested in, in an auto. He has an automobile, but he, he doesn't care what it is. And he told me once, he, he was in a, he's in LA for a while. And he says, I, I really don't care. I, I wish it's just, I just use Uber or Lyft all the time. So he, he, there is, the, the young generation thinks differently. Yeah. If you begin to think of transportation as simply another app on your telephone, it, it has a whole different concept behind it. Start to think about other ways that you can, you can meet those needs. You had said that it was Whitney Tilson? Yes. Whitney, Whitney Tilson. Tilson. Okay. So I wrote that down. Um, I saw for a while there, um, we lost one of our participants. I think he was going to take us outside and show us his his install there, but but he must have lost his rural broadband. Anybody have any issues you wanted to bring up uh, this week? Uh, yeah. Uh huh. I have two. Uh, Jay, I want to let you know that uh, uh, we uh, the college here applied for the uh, EPA approval. Yeah. And you, uh, I think you will be, I, I think you were, no, I talked to David Weaver today. He said you were also notified or something, but. He just, he just sent me through the, all of your emails with all the photos and stuff. Yeah. yeah. There. So that's one thing. So I'm waiting for the course approval. I have a new group of uh, seven students right now. So we'll, that will be the first group uh, doing the ETA level one. Uh, yeah, I passed the exam as well because I was supposed to, I guess. Um, by the way, I also took the uh, NAPSAP uh, PV design specialist, and uh, I got that one now too. But that doesn't relate to it. Uh, that's NAPSAP. That's not ETA. Right. How did I would be curious to know what your impression, the comparable nature of the two exams? Uh, the uh, ETA and the NAPSAP associate? Yeah. Or not the associate, the design. Oh, design specialist was really, really tough. I mean, was it? I, I don't know my score yet, but I don't think it's going to be very high. Um, the ETA is similar to the NAPSEP Associate. Uh -huh. And I couldn't see any um, difference in difficulty. I would say they're both the same. Have you done the installer, uh, NAPSEP no. installer? No? no, I've done the NAPSEP design specialist. Was the design specialist hard legitimately or hard with silly questions? Um, I, with some questions, I felt it was more a reading comprehension problem than uh, testing your knowledge or skill. Uh, uh -huh. I know of one problem that I, I know that I messed it up because it was just an, the way it was worded didn't trigger the right image in my head. Um, I, the reason I was asking that is because sometimes I've seen in past years with their exams, some of the questions are difficult in that they ask you to solve problems that are easily solved just with an app on your phone. You know, a true installer would just calculate angle by holding their phone up next to the building and find the angle. But do you need to have the trigonometry to solve for angle? Oh, they yeah. did one trick. I'm actually pretty good at trick. And they got <laughs> they gave me a problem that made me mad because I, I, I feel like I can solve any kind of shading and trick problem. And 
I had to come back at the very end and spend another 10 minutes on that problem to figure out what, what I was missing. And uh, it made me mad. So they over complicated the shading calculation. Yeah. Um, uh, I think for the PV design specialist, you really need to know where things are in the code book. Uh, I remember one problem. They asked me about a 69,000 KVA line crossing a street. What's the minimum distance above the street? And I, I couldn't find it because it's an industrial application. I couldn't, I couldn't find it that quickly. So I had to take a good guess. I found it for a thousand volts, which is 18 foot, but it was more than a thousand volts. So I don't know. I'm not familiar with it because I don't, I don't design utility scale solar. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I, I thought they were all over the place. Um, very, very broad range of problems. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. That I'll be curious to hear what your results are. You'll, I'm sure you'll share it with me if you pass. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I got the confirmation letter that I passed, but uh, uh -huh. I don't. They they didn't dis disclose the score yet. So okay. I don't know. I'll, I'll get it in the mail in a week or two. Okay. Um, yeah. The other, the last thing that I have is, um, yeah. Since we're on here quite often, and you probably will know what the course looks like, I would like to add you as an advisor to my list. As sure. a advisor to the program yeah yeah no problem i do that on a couple other schools as well yeah so i would email you a, a form that uh, you can review what i sent to david weaver and then you can approve of the course okay i'll send you the address to send the check to right, <laughs> <laughs> right. i'll forward okay. it to administration that's all good yeah. <laughs> okay um any any technical questions any questions in in install that anybody's got yeah. I'm just curious if what you guys think about using used solar panels instead of buying brand new ones. You know, I, I've done it actually. I, um, I, I bought some solar panels. Uh, they were second hand, but they hadn't been used um, and had no problem. But uh, you, you simply don't have warranty if you do that. Sure. So that's just an acceptable risk. The reality in my mind is if the panel looks good and you test it, you know, you can test it really for open circuit voltage for sure. And typically that's all you really need. If you've got them all there and you put your multimeter there and you're checking them and they all seem to be giving you a, a reasonable and similar result, I'd have no problem using them. Um, you know, unless they were old, junky, thin right. film things, but uh, uh, they should have, I mean, they're typically warrantied for 25 years, um, but we're not that old as an industry. We don't know if these things are going to last 100 years or 1,000 years or 21, 25 years in one day, you know, um, which is how most warranties work, right? So, um, so I'd have not, I wouldn't have a problem, but somebody else might I mean, if I'm doing it, and I'm cheap by nature, so I would try yeah. and get it for cheap, you know. When, when I did my panels, it was $9,000 after I had the 30% tax credit. Uh, for the whole install? Yeah, for the whole install. I had 7.2 and I use end phase inverters. Uh huh. And, and I was asking a lot of people questions about it, about solar just in general, because it, but after I did it, I'm like, you know, if I would have bought used solar panels, my ROI would be five years, not nine. Yeah. Well, you know, when I did my second array at our place, uh, I found a deal online. It was actually from uh, Renvu, uh, the distributor, uh, R-E-N-V-U, and they were selling off remnant um, Enphase 215 microinverters. And they were selling them for $29 a piece. And so I bought all the microinverters I needed. And uh, when they arrived, it was interesting because, of course, they were brand new. They hadn't been used, but, but they couldn't sell them in many states because they're no longer, they weren't 1741 SA approved for smart inverters because they were converted over. So some states like California, Colorado, they require that you use the SAs. I'm not sure if Florida has that. I suspect not, because they're not that advanced. But Ohio, where I'm at, um, doesn't require the SA. Um, some utilities do. And uh, so I was able to use them. 
and 29 bucks a piece instead of 160 or whatever a new one was. And I was mentioning last week, I had to, um, I had to replace my first microinverter because it just simply went out and it was one of the 215s. And, uh, and they have a really simple process. In fact, I, I posted a video how to go through that process. And um, they, they did what they said they would do. They, um, they sent me a new microinverter and I just had to put the old one in a box and send it back to them. And they sent a postage paid label um, but they sent me an i7. They sent me a brand new microinverter. Um, so how, so, how so you... I was like, I was the hoping that all of them go bad because uh, <laughs> then I get all brand new i7s, you know. Uh, but it, what was interesting is the, um, the, the warranty begins the day of manufacture, right. not the day of install, which is something I don't think people understand because my microinverters were already six years old when I got them. And so they were already six years into their 25 year warranty, but, but they were warranty. And I don't think Enphase makes any distinction as to whether you were the original buyer or not. I know. Yeah, so you can get used, used inverters too. But I did buy some used Enphase 250 inverters because they're the ones with the, that are black. And I don't know how old those are because like the serial number or the part number or whatever it is. Um, and I threw them into my system and it, it functions, right? Sure. Um, yeah. Each one should operate independently of the other. Right. Which, yeah. um, string inverter do you like the best? Oh, well, it, do you count solar edge as a string inverter? You know, it, it basically is <laughs> with a, with a power optimizer. It's a fixed voltage inverter. I would say the ones that I've, I, and I guess best is sort of like, which ones have I worked with? Uh, it's, it's uh, Sunny Boy is a pretty good, pretty good brand. Um, Fronius, I've worked with those as well. Um, but Solar Edge in the residential marketplace, really um, Enphase and Solar Edge dominate. Um, I think at last I saw it was like 80%, 90% of the market right. is just those two products. So do you have a preference or, or just were curious? Well, I mean, I have a preference. I mean, Enphase, no, no doubt. Um, yeah, uh, I think Enphase is the best, or microinverters in general, and of course Enphase is the dominant player, um, is the best for systems, smaller systems, right? I would say for sure if it's a 5KW or smaller, microinverters is the way to go. If you're a do-it-yourselfer, you know, never having installed systems before, then go bigger. I mean, microinverters are so simple to work with. I would say just go with them. But for bigger systems, like between 7, 8, 15K, W, I would go with Solar Edge, you know, for those. Um, might even look to go with a Store Edge um, because then you could add batteries later. But uh, I don't know. We're we're finding more and more these systems um, are being designed to incorporate batteries, uh, whether they're being installed today or or in the future. In fact, the stats I saw were twenty percent of all systems installed today incorporate batteries, so they're going to be AC coupled or DC coupled systems. And Enphase has a battery system that works with their microinverters. Uh, they they offer that now. It's a little bit pricey, but um, I think uh, Solar Edge has a nice system. Their Store Edge system. Okay. Solar is always good too, Jay. Oh, Solar. Well, there's Don. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I had a, somebody called right when we started, so I had to put it on mute for a minute. Yeah. So well, Solar, of course. Yeah. Solar is a true uh, DC coupled system, and. Uh, I know, yeah, Don, you might have some perspectives on that because that's a true string inverter system. Yeah, I, I like them. They're easy to put in. It's mainly uh, pre-wired, almost everything. Um, and they do have a good capacity. Like you said, Jay, you could put in batteries. You don't have to put in batteries. Uh, you could be on-grid, off-grid. Um, they're pretty flexible. And why do they uh, warranty them for almost 10 to 15 years, whereas Enphase is 20 to 25? 
Well, I can tell you the reason for that primarily is the Enphase microinverters are a solid state unit with no um, with no uh, fan, you know, cooling right. fan. And, and a lot of that, the power supply and the cooling fan is like the weak place in the system. Uh, so, so that becomes a warranty issue. So really, I think the replacement, the ease of replacement, you can buy extended warranties for most of these systems. Mm -hmm. So you can get it up to, I don't know, Don, did you get an extended warranty on your solar? I, I don't think I did. I, is it 10 or 15? I think it was 15 years, but I maybe I'm wrong. Um, but it, you know, I figured by that time, I'm going to be you'll looking be, around. You'll be dead. You'll be dead well, by then. I'll still be alive. <laughs> yeah, I, hopefully, I, unless I'm tinkering with something I shouldn't. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, at that time, I might want to do something else. Who knows? Yeah. The way the market's going. Yeah, and that's true, especially with batteries, you know, because the battery yeah. systems, and that's one of those issues where you say, okay, um, I'd like to have the capacity of adding batteries, but I think the batteries are going to change so dramatically that maybe I don't want to install those just yet, but I'd like the, the ability to do so. And, you mm -hmm. know, that may be a, a misplaced um, action because, of course, the industry changes. Somebody's going to come up with a product that allows you to do that regardless, you know, even if you've got a straight string inverter or microinverter issue. I, I do like with you're talking about the end phase system, their new combiner box, um, you know, for the install where you can put multiple, um, they're not strings, they're much multiple branch circuits of inverters and connect them to the, um, basically it's a, it's a sub panel um, right there on the outside of your house because those typically have four uh, locations. I think it, uh, they take 60 amps. And so you can put in like three strings or three uh, branch circuits of Enphase microinverters plus a battery system into that and never actually have to change your, your wiring uh, to your main house. So that's awfully nice. Um, especially if you're working with a system that's going to be outside and we're going to be installing one of those. I've, um, you know, in coming up here in May in Columbus. So I think that'll be fun to see. I'll probably have more information there. In fact, John, I just saw uh, you adjust your camera. You're, you're the electrician who's going to be actually hooking those things together. I am. You are. So if, I didn't if know that. take oh. out a policy, take out an insurance policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like saying, oh, 60 amps, 240. That's a walk in the park. So I'm not kicking the handle. <laughs> okay, any other any other questions before we call it a day here? Yeah, John. So on um, Tim's system there, uh, so we're doing a ground system, ground array, right? Uh, it's with, it's with, actually gonna be put on the roof of a pavilion, but it's very similar yeah, to a right. ground array. Well, then is that called a roof or ground array? How is that defined? That's a good question. Yeah, it is a question. It, it's, it's basically, I would treat it like a ground mounted system because we're building the pavilion oriented for solar, angled for solar, but it's on a wooden structure. So we'll be using a roof mounted uh, racking system but it has all the aspects of a ground mounted system from a, um, from a setback issue because it's not an occupied building. We don't have to worry about the three foot setbacks from the sides and the peak, you know, so we okay. can go right to the edge. So it's treated like a ground mounted system as far as the um, city is concerned. Although the city doesn't require a uh, structural inspection for a ground mounted system, but they will require it for this uh, pavilion. Yeah, so, yeah, I saw it today, as a matter of fact. Uh, so here's a question. So we're doing micro inverters on each one of, I think, 10 panels, two rows of five? Yeah, yes, uh, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so will that be a go into a combiner box? Yes. It, will it be a single circuit or two circuits? It'll be a single circuit. Yeah, you can go up to, I believe it's, I believe it's up to 15 microinverters in a single branch circuit. 
So we're okay. well under that. Um, that so a single string combiner box. And no, we'll it's shoot. it actually the combiner box has space for three um, or four strings. Okay, but I'm saying the what we're putting in will comprise a single string. You're right. Yes. In a four string combiner box. Okay. Yes. All right. But and you, you will more than fifteen. You start to add it as separate strings. Yes. Okay. I, I just didn't know how that broke down. Yeah, so, and the re the reason we did this is we talked to Tim because he could have avoided the combiner box cost, but um, he was thinking he might in the future double or triple the size of his array. So we're right. future proofing it by putting the combiner box in, and then it also gives us a place to hook up. Um, a, uh, a battery if we want to into the system without actually having to get into his basement to his main panel. And I also suggested, and this is some- Battery inverter storage outside in the pavilion? You, uh, not necessarily in the pavilion, but outside in a, in a box in the backyard. But then that would hook into that combiner box. Exactly. As a string, because it would have an inverter output of the battery yeah the batteries would would be connected and the battery systems typically have their own inverter um okay. built into the battery unit like I a mean, like like, like a, a tesla power, power wall has the batteries and the inverter it's a bimodal inverter that's built in and then that just becomes another circuit of that string uh, of that of that combiner box. Yeah, a string is just a, a thing in, in series. So it would be a separate branch circuit in its own double pole breaker. Well, so. I, am, I am working through Mr. Tim's house. Here, check this out. Okay, all right. I just out all the electric. I mean, this is my okay. scratch. I have well, when, when you're when you're planning the electric, I'd suggest that you run a, a uh, 120 uh, volt AC power out to the pavilion from that uh, combiner box. So he has power out in the pavilion. Okay, all right, makes sense. I just well, think- I was, gonna, I was gonna throw a, you know, probably if I was gonna do it, I'd probably put at least a one inch pipe going back to the house. I mean, you could do it in half inch, but it's nice just for whatever in case he wants to add and all that stuff. And plus pipe is really cheap compared to trenching. Yes, so, yes. Yeah, um, I suggested that maybe you have even to throw a second pipe, like a half inch, just in case he wants to throw something from his house out there. Because once yeah. again, pipe is cheap. You know, he could even so. he could even put the wire in it and cap it off without, so he doesn't have to pull wire in the future. But that's all fun, <laughs> right? Okay, so that'll be a fun project. It'll be a nice one. But we're talking about putting in basically ten panels, and that should only take us less than a day, I would imagine you know, ideally. Yeah. So any other questions before we cut it off here? I do. Yeah. Where can you get the best price for uh, like a 400 watt solar panel without spending over like 250? Uh, oh, a 400, well, you can easily get, <laughs> 400 watt panels for less than 250 bucks from almost any distributor. You're really going to be closer to a $200 price range, you know, full retail. Um, I would say the biggest issue with your panels is trying to find someone local to avoid shipping costs, you know, because the shipping can, can kill you. Um, where are you located? Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown. Uh, any ground mounted arrays that aren't guarded at night? near you that's the cheapest way right <laughs> yeah no thanks right <laughs> so I like um, to on the other side of the fence not that side <laughs> uh you know mcnaught mckay was where tim's going to get it in columbus because it's a electrical distributor and and they're located locally right there in columbus uh gray bar is another distributor that you can get usually locally um youngstown i'm just not sure you're just going to have to check around uh, there's probably an electrical distributor in your area, you know, at, talk to an electrical contractor um, and find out where they get their materials and then give them a call and ask them if they carry solar supplies. Okay. 
because that's probably going to be your best bet. Then again, you can always get them from the big distributors like Wholesale Solar or Alt E or uh, Renvu. Renvu's good. Uh, there's also a company down in uh, Florida. Um, oh. What is it? Sun Elect. Yeah, Sun Electric. Yeah. They basically buy re remainders, I think, and you can get some good deals there. But basically, you got to drive down to pick them up, really. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to pay shipping. Right. If you, or if or you, Siggy will pick them up and drive them up to you for a fee. Yeah, sure. Jay, if you use Renview, they have a, depending on how much you're going to buy over time, you can pay, I think it's like $900 and get free shipping for the entire year. <laughs> yeah, you become part of their Megawatts Club, I think I it think is. That, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, if you're if you're a distributor or if you're an installer, professional installer, that would be worth your while for sure. But if it's just for you, you know, maybe maybe not. So do you have to. So if you get certified, you can become a, or you can get into becoming or labeled as a professional installer, and so you can get those prices. You could you could get them if you bought you know if you paid the fee for that for sure. Um, you, you don't necessarily have to be certified to become an installer. That's going to be a jurisdictional thing. Some states require it, some states don't. Some cities require it, and some don't. So, um, but, but you really should be certified and have the knowledge. Otherwise, you're going to do a crappy job. So, Jay, I will tell you, Alti and, and Renvu both give you better prices if you register with them as an installer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think Alti required you to buy it you know, maybe up to 20,000 in the product before they certified you. You, know, they uh -huh. you put in your credentials and they, you know, after you reach a certain threshold, they give you a better pricing. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think, so that's a place to start. If you can find someone local, that's your best bet. For, for some of the smaller product that you don't have to worry about shipping, it's not a big deal. Um, but really for the racking and for the installation, um, if you're going to be doing a small, small system, you might even contact one of your local installers and ask them if they've got any orphan panels. You know, like they might have done a big project that they bought by the container load or by the pallet, and they might have a half dozen panels just sitting there that sure. they can't use. And and if you're doing microinverters, if you're not worried about mismatch panels, you know, the aesthetics of it, Right. That especially if it's like on a flat roof that nobody's ever going to see, you could get a whole, you know, tapestry of mismatched panels and, and get some pretty cheap prices. So. All right. Well, I'm going to have to cut it off here because I got to get on another call at, at one. But um, I'll go ahead and post this and then uh, we'll meet again on next Tuesday. So thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Take yeah. care. Good week.